So with that, I don't want to take up too much time, but I want to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Dr. Craig Williamson is an Ohio eminent scholar of ecosystem ecology at Miami University of Ohio. Um, previous to being at Miami um, University, Craig was a professor at Lehigh University for many years. So he's been working in Pocono Lakes um, for a long time. Um, he's also an, a recognized expert in climate change, particularly on the effects of climate change on uh, freshwater ecosystems. Um, he's a panelist on the Aquatic Ecosystems Group on the United Nations Environment Program Environmental Effects Assessment Panel. Um, so Craig is able to take research that he's done and that others have done and to um, work directly with the United Nations to make sure that um, we understand how climate change is affecting freshwater ecosystems. Um, he's also served on the panel for freshwater indicators technical team for the National Climate Assessment. Um, he is a founding member of PLEON. He is our chief scientific advisor. So he has been involved in the PLEON project um, since its beginnings and we are very happy that he has taken the time um, to, to give this presentation today. Uh, the way I understand it is that the presentation is structured so there'll be time um, for questions after, after specific modules. And again, as you um, come up with questions, please feel free to dump them right in the chat. Dan will collate them and make sure that your questions get addressed. So without any further um, ado from me, I will turn this over to Dr. Williamson. Hey, good, mor good morning all. Um, I wanna thank Beth, first of all, for inviting me. I also wanna thank uh, Dan Kaufman, the intern who's gonna be running some of the uh, chat this morning. And most of all, I want to thank you all for coming out, or maybe I should say staying in this morning when you could be out enjoying your lakes. Uh, this is particularly important because you all are the lake managers. In Pennsylvania, the state takes very little care of our beautiful lakes in the Poconos. And so effectively, you are all the lake managers. And with the help of uh, Pleon or other sources of information, hopefully you can do a good job and in shepherding those lakes. Uh, I spent, as Beth mentioned, over three decades studying Pocono Lakes. And I want to relate a little bit to you this morning about what we've seen in terms of the effects of climate change over these three decades or so. I'll start with a view of the lake where I spend some time, which you should be able to see on your screen here. One of the most beautiful sunsets that I've ever seen. It's, uh, what happens here is lakes, among other things, open up the sky to us. We get to see the night sky, we get to see beautiful sunsets and all kinds of beautiful scenes. This one, however, is a bit ominous because the reason this was such an exceptional sunset is due to fires in the western part of Canada. The smoke came all the way over from Canada and created these beautiful sunsets in our lakes. So why is it that we should be concerned about climate change in lake ecosystems. Why is this even a concern? Well, one might be smoke from wildfires, distant wildfires, and how that might change lake ecosystems, something we've studied and indeed does change them. Uh, the other is that really at the core of it, we really love our lakes and everything that they provide. And you all have had a great time, I'm sure, on your lakes, whether it be boating or fishing or swimming or out for walks, looking at some of the incredible plants, some of which are very dependent upon the water, such as the arrowhead here or the uh, cardinal flower at the top, um, great spangled fritillaries on wood lilies in the lower left here. There's also a variety of wildlife we tend to see. This is a wood, uh, uh, river otter slide in the middle in the snow here. There's snapping turtles and uh, great blue herons, beautiful golden uh, dragonflies, eagles, bears. Anyway, it br just brings out some really beautiful wildlife. Those are mink footprints that you can catch in the winter, flying squirrel in the upper left. So lakes just bring us a lot closer to the natural world. So the question we're going to address today is how is climate change influencing lakes? And this is the brief answer, but rather complicated answer. 
And my plan is to try to simplify this for you. Climate change has many, many effects on aquatic ecosystems all over the world. We're gonna to focus today on the Pocono Lakes. And the two things I wanna focus on in particular are the fact that climate change leads to a warmer world, but also it leads to a wetter world. Variably wet, however. And this warmer and wetter climate influences a whole variety of aquatic ecosystem services, water and food security, water quality, fisheries, lakes and freshwater, and uh, marine ecosystems as carbon dioxide sinks for greenhouse gases and the food webs as well. So in short, that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Warmer conditions, wetter conditions, and how that influences lakes. I'm gonna break this down into three separate modules. One is I wanna spend a couple minutes asking what is climate change? This might seem to be pretty obvious. Climate change is a matter of things are getting warmer out there, but there's more to it. As I mentioned, we're gonna look at how a wetter climate in this region in particular also alters lakes. So we're gonna look at how climate change inf influences lakes in the second module, and then we're gonna ask what can we do about climate change effects on lakes? And this is our star couple at their favorite lake, who will be asking us some questions throughout these different modules. Younger generation, who are probably the ones we really need to consider when we ask about climate change and effects on lakes. And the first question they're asking is, what is climate change anyway? Well, we all know that climate change is a matter of warming. And these are surface temperature changes across the globe from about 1986 to 2016. So those three decades compared to the first six decades of the 1900s. And what we can see is that climate has warmed throughout a good part of the world. And in some cases up to two and a half or three degrees Fahrenheit. The other major component of climate change is the increase in extreme events and extreme precipitation. And it can be extreme heavy precipitation when it rains, it pours, or it also can be a matter of drought in some regions. But this map here shows the percent increase in precipitation in different areas of the country. And you can see that here in the Eastern part of Pennsylvania, we are in one of the areas that has seen the greatest increase in extreme precipitation events with a 55% increase from 1958 to 2016. We're all familiar with these extreme events, hearing the stories in recent years in particular about some of the tropical storms that have dropped, for instance, several feet of rain in single episodes. We're not talking several inches here. When I was young, I remember several inches of rain was a big rainfall. Now we're talking about Hurricane Harvey in 2017 dropping three feet of rain. Hurricane Florence down in North Carolina in 2018 dropping almost three feet of rain as well. 2019, uh, it was uh, Tropical Storm Barry that dropped on the order of uh, two feet of rain in some regions of the south. And this of course has a big effect, not only on lakes, but on human infrastructure. This is some flooding in the Midwest last spring that we all heard about that destroyed not only where we live, but also a lot of the farmland uh, in the region and the crops for the year. So these are a big uh, deal, not only a warmer world, but a wetter world is really changing the planet. And today what we're going to be doing is looking at how some of these things influence lakes, how specifically climate change is influencing lakes. So I'll stop there just briefly to see if there are any questions. That's kind of background more than anything. But if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take a few questions at this point. So far, we're looking good, Craig. So if you want to continue, please. Okay, great. So I'm going to be asking, or actually, our star couple here is asking next, how is climate change influencing lakes? And we'll start out with a warmer aspect. The fact that the world is getting warmer 
air temperature, surface temperatures are getting warmer, and this is throughout the globe. It turns out there is a recent study of lakes and how surface temperatures are warming in lakes. And this is a, a map of the world showing the lakes in different locations. And the red dots indicate lakes that are warming and the blue dots lakes that are cooling. And what the authors here found, uh, and actually our lakes were included in this study as well, the lakes I'll be talking about today. Uh, and we found that uh, the water temperatures are warming on an average of about 0.61 degrees Fahrenheit per decade. That's not over the last hundred years, that's per decade over the last few decades. So warmer water temperatures are one of the big things that we are likely to see. And what I'm gonna do today is use three lakes from the Poconos that we've studied now for over 30 years, three decades. So three lakes for three decades. We're gonna look at a blue lake, which is our most uh, clear water, pristine lake. You used to be able to see down to the bottom of the lake, even though it's on the order of 70 to 80 feet deep. And then we have a brown lake. This is Lake Lackawack, a little bit browner in color. There's higher concentrations of something called dissolved organic matter. It comes from the surrounding catchment. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, throughout this talk. And then we have a, a greener lake, which is green because it has a little bit higher concentration of algae. And we wanna look specifically at how these three lakes are responding. And we'll start out by looking at surface water temperatures. And so what you can see is that these are changes in temperature, it's degrees Celsius, which we'll all be using at some point, not quite yet for most people, but uh, think of it as approximately twice uh, degrees Fahrenheit plus 32 degrees. Um, and what you can see is that uh, the important thing is the patterns over time. And in the Blue Lake in particular, for example, it's increased from about an average of around 22 degrees C up to close to 25 degrees C. So that's five or six degrees Fahrenheit over the last three decades. And the Brown Lake and the Green Lake have shown similar patterns. So our lakes, as lakes around the world, are showing increases in surface water temperatures. You can make it kind of nice for swimming, but there are other effects as well. So these are all mid-July values too, I should mention. Go down deeper into the lake and look at the temperature. And interestingly, the temperature is decreasing somewhat in all three lakes. And that pattern, again, is particularly strong in the Blue Lake. So we have a situation here where the most pristine of the lakes, the bluest of the lakes, the Clearwater Lake, really Clearwater Lake, is showing the strongest changes. Surface water temperatures are warming the greatest and deep water temperatures are cooling. And you might say, wait a minute, we're talking about climate warming here. How is it that the deep waters are cooling? And we'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along, but the bottom line is that the Blue Lake and the other lakes as well are not only changing in temperature, but they're changing in the transparency. The lake is not as clear as it used to be, and so there's more absorption of light in the surface waters causing that warming. And that means the light doesn't get down to deeper waters, which means the deeper waters are cooling. And again, we'll talk more about that as we move on. One of the implications of warmer surface waters is that they favor cyanobacteria. These are the bacteria, cyanobacteria, the algae, blue-green algae, they're also called, that cause harmful algal blooms. And these can cause uh, production of, or they can produce some of the uh, algae produce microcystins and other toxins that can be both liver and brain toxins. Some of them are potentially carcinogenic. They can kill pets. Just in the last couple of weeks, there was a big blow up at Zion National Park where there was a toxic algae bloom where a puppy died and several dogs died last summer as well from drinking the water, even just bathing in the water and bathing in the water, they'll drink some of it. And of course, this is uh, harmful to humans as well. 
There's another effect too of warming air temperatures and that is less ice. So there's a change in the amount of ice cover. And this is not only locally in our lakes, this is a planetary phenomenon. One of the most striking pictures that I've ever seen is this picture of the melting of the Arctic sea ice. And so this orange line here shows where the average sea ice extent was between 1979 and 2010. And this is where it was in 2012, where the white edge of the ice is. And then in the lower right here, you can see this decrease in the average September extent of sea ice. And the predictions are that in another few decades, there'll be no Arctic sea ice at all. So this is really a planetary scale phenomenon. Lakes, the same kind of thing is happening. Over the last 150 years, the duration of ice cover has decreased by about 30 days. That's about a month. So there's less ice and there's thinner ice. And again, this is a worldwide study of lakes, actually lakes and rivers, that shows that this duration of ice cover is decreasing substantially. And it's accelerated. It's two and a half times as fast in the last, last uh, decade or so than it was before that. So our lakes are losing ice. And if we get back here to the Pocono Lakes, we find that ice is thawing even in midwinter. These are some pictures from some ice cameras. And we have Beth to thank for helping put these out and collect the data on these. Um, they're put out on several of our uh, study lakes here. And this is a picture in mid-December showing the ice cover on this lake and the snow cover. And then come January, middle of January, the ice is melted. It's open water. And that is January 12th, it's not June 12th. And again, the lake is wide open. This is an unusual phenomenon, but it's gonna be something we see more and more often here in the Poconos. The lake then refroze. There was a second period of ice cover later in January and into February. So this intermittent ice cover is one of the things that's happening. And this is of concern as well, because these shorter periods of ice cover create, first of all, opportunity for the waters to warm more to, for, from the sunlight, and they cause a mixing of the water up from the bottom of the lake if there's a lot of wind, which can bring nutrients up. And this, again, can increase the chances of harmful algal blooms. And so, again, another negative effect here of these uh, warming uh, conditions. Okay, that's warmer conditions. I can pause again if people have any questions on that. Next, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about <clears throat> changes due to precipitation and extreme events. So I don't know if there are any questions at this point. We do have one question, Craig. Um, why is ice cover important to lakes? Well, it's important for a number of reasons. Um, one of the main things is that it seals off the lake and it prevents wind-driven mixing, which can bring nutrients up from the bottom of the lake. Um, it also, uh, the snow cover on top of it can block the light, and that can keep algae from growing uh, throughout the winter as well um, as during the, the uh, ice-free season. So those are two of the major regions, reasons. And so if you get uh, ice out earlier, as we're seeing, you get an extended period for mixing of the lake, extended period for warming of the waters because there's no, no more reflection of the uh, uh, sunlight back. And again, it gives an extended period for uh, warming the waters and causing harmful algal blooms. That's one of the major reasons. It's also important to a number of organisms that, that live in the lake as well. Other questions? That's it for now. Okay, well, let's take a look at the increase in precipitation. There's been on the order of um, a 40% or so increase in the precipitation during the 27 year study period uh, when we've looked at this in the Pocono region. Um, so again, substantial increases in rainfall, including these increases in extreme events. And one of the things that happens is when you get this increase in storms and precipitation, is it causes this brown stuff called dissolved organic matter to wash into the lakes. 
dissolved organic matter is something you might not have heard of, but you certainly know very well. Anybody who had a cup of tea this morning or a cup of coffee, when you put those tea leaves in a cup of clear water, the dissolved organic matter leaches out of them. And that's what you're seeing, that's what you're drinking, whether it be coffee or tea. When you walk along a sidewalk, after leaves have fallen on the sidewalk or a road and it rains, it leaches the dissolved organic matter out and you can see the uh, outline of the leaf basically with the dissolved organic matter in the, in the sidewalk. So basically what's happening then is these leaves and branches and twigs and other things from uh, trees, bushes and other shrubs and herbaceous plants um, fall to the ground. They decompose but they only partly decompose to dissolve organic matter and then that precipitation the increases in rainfall wash that into the lakes. And what that does is it increases the dissolved organic matter concentrations and turns the lakes brown, as you can see in the flasks down below, with different amounts of dissolved organic matter. Consequences, why does that matter? Who cares, other than aesthetically, it may be not quite as pleasing to have a lake be brown, this, but this high dissolved organic matter can uh, be a real problem in drinking water reservoirs. For instance, an example of a storm event, uh, Irene, Tropical Storm Irene that hit the region in 2011, uh, turned the Ashokan, one branch of the Ashokan Reservoir totally brown. There's sediments in there as well, but a lot of this brown color is the dissolved organic matter. Luckily, they had a weir to hold that back because high concentrations of dissolved organic matter in water when it's chlorinated produce carcinogenic byproducts. So it's a real threat to drinking water quality to have high concentrations of dissolved organic matter. If nothing else, it makes it much more expensive to remove that dissolved organic matter during the water treatment process. So there's another effect of this dissolved organic matter and the increase in precipitation. And that is, as I mentioned before, it causes absorption of the sunlight in the surface waters. And that causes warmer surface waters and cooler, deeper waters. And so it changes the mixing depth here. And so one way to look at it is if you have a blue lake, what's called an oligotrophic water body, there's deep mixing that goes on because the light penetrates quite deep. It's not all absorbed in the surface waters. In a browner lake, however, when a blue lake turns brown, the light is absorbed in the surface waters, it's warmer there, and so you get a shallower mixing depth due to that change in water transparency. And there are other influences as well, and they have to do with the aquatic ecosystem services. That mixing depth influences nutrient cycling, uh, can affect the uh, fisheries and the oxygen levels, as we'll mention in a minute as well. So basically these aquatic ecosystem services are really influenced as, as are the food webs by this change in dissolved organic matter. There's another really valuable ecosystem service that's provided by sunlight. I think you all know that if you go out in the sun for too long without any sunscreen on, you get burned by the ultraviolet radiation. So it turns out that that ultraviolet radiation also provides a really valuable ecosystem service. And then it disinfects pathogens things like bacteria, viruses, protozoans, including coronaviruses, which can be disinfected very rapidly by sunlight. In fact, less than half an hour, you can disinfect in full sunlight uh, coronaviruses. There are re recent articles that have just been published on this. So there's a very valuable ecosystem service being provided that sun by that sunlight hitting the water, disinfecting the surface water. The problem is when you get runoff, and this increase in organic matter, that organic matter acts as a sunscreen. It absorbs the ultraviolet radiation selectively, actually, just as sunscreens do that you would put on. And what that means is that there's no more or at least reduced solar disinfection by the ultraviolet radiation. So this turning of the lakes brown by increases in precipitation really influences this valuable ecosystem service where sunlight is disinfecting surface waters. 
there's another angle on this too, and that is mosquitoes. There are two species of subtropical mosquitoes that are moving north. These cause a variety of diseases, Zika, dengue, and chikungunya, among, among other viruses. And these mosquitoes, subtropical mosquitoes, due in part to the warming climate, warming conditions, are spreading north. And in fact, you can see that Pennsylvania is kind of at the front line for both of these species. They can potentially exist now in Pennsylvania. And this is of a real concern. And it turns out that this dissolved organic matter that absorbs UV radiation also protects mosquitoes from UV radiation. As you may know, mosquito larvae are aquatic and in a lake with low dissolved organic carbon concentrations, low dissolved organic matter on the left, you can see very high levels of UV. And so those larvae that have to stay right up at the surface because they have a breathing tube there, they need to stay near the surface. And if there's a lot of UV radiation, that can kill the mosquito larvae and prevent them from maturing into adults. But if your lake turns brown, there's a UV refuge. There's a refuge from that damaging UV radiation. The mosquitoes can survive and they can emerge to adults. So that's another concern, another valuable ecosystem service here provided by UV that's um, basically reduced um, by the presence of dissolved organic matter. So I can pause there to see if there are any questions. What I'd like to do is jump into some more of the data from our lakes and look in particular at how transparency of the lakes has changed and some of the other ways lakes have changed. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take questions at this point. Yeah, Craig, I have two questions here. Um, one is, is there anything we can do to help reduce um, dissolved organic matter in the lake, such as raking and burning leaves, clearing leaves out from drainage ditches, et cetera? Um, unfortunately, you'd have to remove the leaves from pretty much your whole watershed from the whole area if you were to do that. Uh, so I don't think that's a major um, solution in this case. A lot of that dissolved organic matter is actually produced underground as well and uh, leaches out through the groundwater in addition to runoff. So um, I don't think that removing leaves, it, it, while it could reduce the organic matter inputs very locally, you'd have to really remove them from a, a huge, huge area to have any impact at all. And even then you would influence the nature of the soils and there are other issues as well. Um, and also can lake water be, um, this is a two part question, can lake water be filtered to remove the dissolved organic matter and um, do leaf ashes contribute to dissolved organic matter in lake water? So the first question is uh, dissolved organic matter by definition is that that goes through a filter. So it cannot be filtered out, but it can be through chemical means coagulated and some water treatment facilities have to do this, but you can't actually filter it out because by definition, it's that material that goes through the filter. So it's dissolved. In terms of wood ashes, um, ashes uh, can create a lot of problems in lakes and we're just beginning to understand this. Um, I actually have a study going on um, in uh, the western United States on the effects of uh, ashes and, and wildfires on lakes. And there's a whole variety of ways that ashes negatively influence lakes. But if we're talking about burning, burning a small pile of leaves on the shore of a lake, I don't think that's gonna make a big difference in this region. Wildfires make a huge difference. The small burning of leaf piles, less so. Any other questions or I'll go ahead and move on. Uh, there's one more that just popped up. Um, it's a, uh, it says, seems like good riparian buffers may help this problem with runoff and increase in de, uh, dissolved organic matter. Would you say that that's true? Yes, riparian buffers or planting vegetation along the shore and protecting that vegetation can be critically important for a lot of reasons for water quality. 
And one of the things that I'm not going to talk a lot about here, and you'll find out why in a minute, is nutrients. But nutrients are really, really important to water quality in those riparian buffers, or again, planting vegetation along sides of lakes and, and rivers, streams, inlets, uh, is really important in terms of taking up nutrients and preventing erosion. Less so for the dissolved organic matter. But they can reduce, certainly do, re reduce the amount of runoff or, or amount of uh, groundwater entering, which could help to some extent. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the data from the lakes. These the brown, uh, blue, brown, and green lakes, um, three of our Pocono lakes. And first we're gonna start with Secchi transparency. Uh, this is just a matter of taking a small disc, black and white disc, like you see in the upper left here, lowering it down, and how deep can you see that? And in um, the blue lake, we used to be able to see the Secchi disc down at a depth of 50 feet or more. And now sometimes we can't even see it at 20 feet. The brown lake, similar decreases in Secchi transparency, and the green lake, again, decreases in Secchi transparency. But we again see the situation where the blue lake is showing, the most pristine lake is showing the greatest changes. And this is due to these increases in dissolved organic matter, uh, which we've been talking about to a great extent. And you might say, well, what about algae? Well, we'll take a look at that as well. Algae, the chlorophyll, uh, we, we use chlorophyll here to measure the amount of algae in a lake, a phytoplankton. And you can see in the blue lake, they have been very, very low uh, in concentrations throughout the time period, little or no change. Same thing with the brown lake, a little bit higher concentration of algae, of chlorophyll here, uh, but still no significant change over time. And same with the green lake. The Green Lake has a bit higher concentration of chlorophyll, that's why it's green. Uh, and in some cases, it's had some algae blooms. You can see one or two points that are much higher than the others. But um, overall, there's been no long-term trend in chlorophyll. So that means that this reduction in transparency that we're seeing in these lakes is not attributable to increases in algae. And that's an important point we'll get back to in a minute. Let's take a look at phosphorus. Phosphorus, as some of you may know, is a really key nutrient for algae. And if you increase the phosphorus in a lake, you generally will increase the algae. In all three lakes, we're not seeing any significant increase in phosphorus concentrations. So in spite of the increase in precipitation and runoff, this is a good sign. It suggests that the watersheds of these lakes are being well taken care of and they're not, there's not a lot of uh, use of fertilizers or bad leaky septic systems that would bring nutrients into the lake. So in this case, it's not uh, a story of the lakes changing in response to nutrients and chlorophyll and algae, but rather due to the dissolved organic matter. So let's take a look at the oxygen concentrations. Oxygen is really important in lakes, particularly for organisms like fish that need that oxygen to survive. Cold water fish in particular need high concentrations of oxygen. And what you can see is that there's been little or no change in any of these lakes in the oxygen in the surface waters. Very, very slight decrease, and this is probably due to the fact that oxygen is more soluble in colder water. So as those surface waters are warming, there has been a slight decrease in oxygen. But basically in the surface waters, that oxygen is mixed in from the air by the wave action, so there's not a serious problem with oxygen depletion. Deeper waters is a little different story. The Blue Lake in particular, again, Blue Lake being more sensitive, has decreased in oxygen from around 10 milligrams per liter down to about half that much in the deeper waters. Again, these are mid-July values. Not as much change in the brown and green lake. The brown and green lake have been very low oxygen, hypoxic to no oxygen, anoxic throughout the time period. And the reason for this is that, that organic matter, whether it be from runoff, from around the lake or whether it be from 
algae in the green lake settling down to the bottom of the lake and decomposing, that all consumes oxygen in the deeper waters. So why is it that the blue lake is showing this decrease? Why is it such a strong pattern, particularly when there's no decrease in the surface waters? If you remember, we have warming surface waters because we have a somewhat browner lake now. Our blue lake is starting to turn brown. And that absorbs the light in the surface waters, which means less light deep down. And with less light, there's less light sunlight for photosynthesis, which means less production of oxygen in those deep waters. And the additional dissolved organic matter means more consumption of the oxygen. And that's why we're tending to see the decrease in oxygen in those deep waters. And the problem here is for cold water fish in particular, like some of the salmonids, those low oxygen levels can cause some real stress. They cannot go up to the surface water where the oxygen levels are somewhat higher because uh, they can't withstand the warm surface water temperatures. So here's the real culprit. It's dissolved organic matter. And we measure dissolved organic matter by measuring the carbon in it, dissolved organic carbon. So that is what gives it a lot of the color here. And what you can see is that the Blue Lake in particular has a doubling or more of the dissolved organic carbon concentrations over the last three decades. The Brown Lake and Green Lake are also increasing in dissolved organic carbon, but not as much proportionally. So we're not going from four to eight, we're going from about four to five or six. And then again, substantial increases in the Green Lake, but not a doubling like we're seeing in the Blue Lake. So all of the lakes though, are turning somewhat browner, more dissolved organic matter. But again, the Blue Lake is the one that's really showing the strongest changes. It's the one that seems to be most sensitive to changes. This is really quite interesting if you think about it. Because if you talk to consultants and lake managers and people who study lakes, the classic lake management paradigm is that nutrients drive algae blooms. And that's the primary concern. And I support that. That's absolutely true. If you have a blue lake and you add nutrients, you can end up with a green lake and more algae blooms. So nutrients are of primary importance. But what we've seen in the Pocono lakes in recent years is not lakes turning greener. We see lakes that are turning browner. And so rather than just looking at blue versus green lakes, we need to consider brown lakes and the fact that this dissolved organic matter is what's increasing. And so kind of the takeaway message here for how lakes seem to be responding over the last three decades in the Poconos is that they tend to be turning browner. Even the green lakes tend to be turning browner. And as a consequence, there's a sacrifice of a lot of important ecosystem services. The oxygen is decreasing, which can threaten the fishery, particularly in the clearer lakes. There's an increase in the potential for pathogens. That's a potential increase in uh, contagious diseases of not only humans, but of wildlife. There's also uh, sheltering a refuge provided for mos uh, mosquitoes and other vectors of disease. And this isn't something that's acute. It's not something that's headlines at this point, but it's certainly something that we need to take into consideration when we're considering the management of lakes. We don't want to just be measuring chlorophyll concentrations. We need to be keeping a close eye on dissolved organic matter concentrations as well, because that's where the lakes are really changing. There's another part of the story here, and this is actually a good news part of the story. And that is that this region in particular, you can see in the left hand uh, map here where we're located, the little black and yellow X. It used to be in the middle of an acid deposition storm. The acid deposition used to be kilograms per hectare, very, very high levels of acid, largely from fossil fuel burning 
and industry in the Midwest and the prevailing winds bringing that over to us in this area of Pennsylvania. The good news is that the Clean Air Act Amendment of 90, 1990 and subsequent amendments have led to a real reduction in acid deposition. So the map on the right shows acid deposition. This is hydrogen ion deposition, but just think of it as how acid the rain is uh, in 2014. And you can see that this legislation made a huge difference. So the important take home message here is twofold. One is that this recovery from acid deposition has actually contributed to the increase in dissolved organic matter, but legislation can actually make a difference in terms of the human impact on the environment. And you can see that in terms of the recovery of some of the lakes here from more acidic conditions. Again, uh, the blue lake showing the strongest pattern. The pH used to be down around five, so seven is neutral. Lower pH is acidic, higher is basic. And you can see that the blue lake is recovering almost up to neutral at this point. And the, the brown lake has shown a small increase uh, and the green lake as well, but again, the strongest changes really in the blue lake, again, this time in response to recovery from acid deposition. Let's get back to what we can do about this. Craig? Yes. Yeah, I have a couple questions if you'd like to field them. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think this is a good time to pause and ask some questions or answer some questions uh, before we move on to what we can do about these effects. Currently I have two of them. Um, and the first one is that we have been trying to increase transparency by treating our lake with bacteria to decrease plankton. Our lake is also brown. What is the impact of phytoplankton versus dissolved organic material on transparency? So that's actually multiple questions here. Um, I uh, must say I'm very skeptical of a bacteria treatment. Um, I'm not here to uh, answer questions specifically on lake management. To manage a lake effectively, you really need to know a lot more about it. Um, you need to know a lot about, in fact, the, the follow-up question there, second part of the question there that focuses on the relative importance of organic matter versus uh, algae or phytoplankton in, in controlling transparency. It really depends on the lake and it depends on the catchment around the lake and what's going on in it. If there are a lot of nutrients, it's likely to be a greener lake. And in that case, the algae are more important in regulating water transparency. If there are a lot of wetlands around the lake, swamps and wetland areas, then there are likely to be uh, higher concentrations of dissolved organic matter. And then it's more likely to be dissolved organic matter that controls the transparency. So the answer is that both control it and it depends on the lake, um, which, which is more important. So the important thing is to sample it. Just as a doctor would want to take your pulse and take, uh, take your blood pressure and some basic information on you, you want to work with a group. This is what Pleon offers, for example. Uh, take the pulse of your lake, uh, collect some data, find out what the chlorophyll concentrations are, find out what the dissolved organic matter concentrations are, find out what the plankton concentrations are. And it's not, uh, the plankton are not only the algae, there's zooplankton that eat those algae and you need to know something about the fisheries. And we'll talk a little bit about that next in terms of what we can do. Are there other questions? Yep, there's one more. Uh, this one is, wouldn't the browning of lakes be a natural aging process regardless of climate change? Yes, there's no question that lakes will turn browner over time. In fact, some of the lakes that I've studied have been um, glacial lakes uh, that are proglacial lakes where the in regions where glaciers have just receded over the recent decades. And you can see there's no organic matter, there's no vegetation in the uh, initial watershed uh, in the catchment area. And so uh, as you get more and more vegetation in these initial glacial basins, more uh, shrubs, trees, bushes, or herbaceous plants growing up, you get more and more dissolved organic matter. And eventually the lakes will fill in. 
and they'll become wetlands themselves. And, and through that process, you get higher and higher dissolved organic matter. But you would not see it at the rates that we're seeing it now in recent decades. That's clearly not just due to that natural successional process. Other questions? That is it at the moment. Thank you. Okay, well, the next question that this young couple is going to guide us into here is what can we do about climate change effects on lakes? One of the first things is to encourage native aquatic plants, the so called macrophytes, it means big plant. We're showing a variety of photos here of some of the ones that are common in the Pocono Lakes, and these serve to stabilize the sediments. They compete with the algae by reducing light and nutrients, and they also provide good habitat for fish. So while this doesn't directly address the dissolved organic matter question, it certainly addresses the potential for algae blooms and also a good fishery. You also wanna encourage filter feeding animals. And again, because it's dissolved organic matter, they're not gonna remove the dissolved organic matter, but what these filter feeding animals can do again is remove some of the algae, including the harmful algae. And so when we talk about plankton, they're algae, which are phyto or plant plankton, but they're also zoo or animal plankton, which are algae eaters. And you can see a whole variety of them here. Crustaceans, uh, copepods, uh, cladocerans, and then rotifers as well over on the left-hand side of the screen that are all algae eaters and they can help maintain transparency. Mussels in the bottom of our lake. Several people have called me through the years and said, oh no, we have mussels in our lake. Should we take them out? Is this a problem? And the answer is no, they're good. You wanna avoid, of course, the invasive zebra mussels and quagga mussels because they fundamentally change your ecosystem in a different way, but the native mussels are a good thing to have. A lot of people aren't aware too that there are freshwater sponges in lakes. People think of sponges as being only marine, but these are excellent filter feeders and they can be little, um, uh, and crustaceans like this, which are a few inches across, or some of the sponges get to be quite large and can be several feet across. And these are basically living filters and these are good, again, for your, for your lake. Bryozoan, similar. They're called moss animals sometimes. People <laughs> see these and they call me up and they're horrified. What is this big ugly thing that looks like somebody, the brain fell out of somebody's head doing in my lake? And these can be up to several feet across. They're gigantic, but they're actually very, very beautiful if you look at them closely. They have something called a lophophore, a special appendage. They're a little, it's a colony of microscopic organisms that are filtering very heavily a lot of the algae out of the lake. And again, can really help increase water clarity and help with water quality. Again, this is not addressing the dissolved organic matter question, but it is addressing water quality in terms of the uh, harmful algal blooms, which are more and more of a threat as we get that increase in dissolved organic matter. Another thing to help manage your lake better is to throw the big ones back. I know people don't like to hear it. They um, are very tasty fish, but in fact, some of these little guys are as tasty or, or tastier than the big fish. And the reason to throw the big fish back and in fact, keep the little fish, is the little fish tend to eat the zooplankton. We want more zooplankton because they eat the algae. If there are a lot of little fish, they eat the zooplankton all up and therefore you get algae blooms. If you have big fish, the big fish eat the little fish. So there are more zooplankton and less algae. So this is a food web interaction. So it's good for your lake to throw those big ones back or at least not catch too many of them because again, they help with the water quality. This has been shown repeatedly. Not quite as strong as a nutrient effect, but it's, a, it's one of the beneficial effects. Okay, so let me give a brief summary here and then I will take some more questions. I have a little bit more to say, but I'll take some questions after this brief summary. Surface waters are warming. There's less ice, shorter ice duration in the winter, and this all increases the chance of harmful algal blooms. 
The primary thing that we're observing is an increase in dissolved organic matter, which is causing a browning of the lakes. And this is due largely to the increases in precipitation and extreme events and a recovery from acid deposition, and this lowers the water transparency. With lower water transparency, there's less oxygen. There's less oxygen in the surface waters because it's warmer, and warm water doesn't hold as much oxygen. And in deeper waters, there's much less oxygen in the Blue Lakes in particular because of the shading from the dissolved organic matter and the increase in the decomposition of that dissolved, dissolved organic matter and dead algae. The other take home message here is that it's the most pristine blue lakes, the oligotrophic lakes that are changing most rapidly. And last but not least, we as citizens can really make a difference in slowing down some of these effects. One of the best ways, of course, we can make a difference is to reduce energy consumption, support alternative energy sources, reduce the impacts of climate change, reduce the incidence of wildfires. This is something that's going to take decades. It's gonna be a long and tough battle, but it is something as we've seen with acid deposition, we can make a difference and it's going to make a difference to our lakes. So in terms of what the future holds, what the future path is, In terms of climate change in lakes, the question is, will we sink or swim? The last question from our young couple here. And the answer really is in your hands. Again, you, we are the lake managers, particularly in the Pocono Lakes. So with that, I'll take any questions. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. Williamson. And do you think that, you know, when we say we should reduce our energy, use alternative uh, energy sources, um, a break away from fossil fuels to introduce the, you know, to help reduce the effects of climate change, um, how important do you think um, is taking a political stance as well, voting and keeping an eye on things like legislature? Well, I think, um there, there are two parts to that question, really. One is, um, has, has to do with the politics of climate change. And climate change is not a political issue. People make it a political issue for their own financial gain, but climate change is simply not a politi political issue. It's a reality. And we all need to work together to address this. And I actually think that more and more, in fact, for example, some people say Republicans don't believe in climate change, but for the majority of Republicans do believe in climate change. We're just not seeing their representatives necessarily acting on that. So it's not a political issue. But that being said, because people are trying to make it a political issue for their own financial gain, I think it is important to keep an eye on, um, to, to vote and, and, and actively keep an eye on legislation support legislation that will address climate change, reduction in, in um, fossil fuel use. And the good news, of course, is we're reaching a tipping point where across a majority of the country, even the world now, it actually is cheaper to use alternative energy. If you're gonna build a new power plant, you wanna build an alternative energy power plant rather than use coal in particular because it's less expensive. So we're reaching a critical financial tipping point which I think bodes well, but of course, the more quickly we can make, make this change, the better off we are. Any other questions? Uh, it looks clear at the moment. Could you talk a little bit about an ecological tipping point, right? When you think about lakes, you, you've described this progression, particularly in the Blue Lake shifting uh, to become something else. What are the concepts of an ecological tipping point and can you go backwards? Can sure, absolutely, yeah, yeah. If you, if you start with a real blue lake, which is how all these lakes started, in fact, when the, you know, in this region, the majority of the lakes are glacially, um, of glacial origin and were carved out by the glaciers. And they all started, as I mentioned, as very, very blue lakes, very clear water lakes. And uh, as there's more and more nutrients in the, that are released in the 
in the, within the watershed by processing, by weathering, breaking down some of the uh, till and the, and the bedrock. You get more vegetation, you get increase in dissolved organic matter. Uh, you get humans moving in that bring nutrients with them in a variety of ways. And therefore you get uh, increase or decrease in, in uh, increase in algae, increase in dissolved organic matter, which decreases water transparency. And that decrease in water transparency can eventually lead to a lack of oxygen in the deep waters. And so that blue lake can turn into a brown lake or into a green lake where there is no oxygen in the deeper waters. And what that does, if there's no oxygen in the deep waters, that brings the nutrients back up out of the sediments. And if the nutrients come out of the sediments, that stimulates more algal blooms, which stimulates less oxygen in the deep waters as it blocks the light down there and more organic matter for decomposition. And so that can actually lead to a tipping point that accelerates the progressive aging of the lakes and uh, turning the blue lakes into browner or greener lakes. Other questions? Yes, there is. Um, is it possible to um, buy or add things such as mussels or sponges, floating islands, increasing aeration? I think this has to go to trying to increase transparency. Um, there are all kinds of ways uh, to manage a lake. And uh, again, I'm very hesitant. It's like going to a doctor and saying, I'm sick. Can you please prescribe a medicine for me? And what are they gonna prescribe for you? And uh, lakes are very, very diverse. They're influenced by multiple things. And there is a wide variety of ways to manage them. Um, but I'm very, very hesitant to make any suggestions on a, in a general sense here, because it would be like me going to a doctor and saying, can you pre prescribe me the best medicine? And they would say the best medicine for what? And they would have it at least be taking your temperature, taking your pulse and uh, uh, your blood pressure. And again, some other basic, doing some basic scans, maybe understand what, what the problem is before they can tell you what to do. Um, also, can you speak to the detriments of creating man-made lakes in terms of overall ecosystem services, loss of streams, methane production, et cetera? Wow, so that's a huge question. Whoever asked that question obviously, obviously knows a little bit about aquatic ecosystems, and um, there are multiple things that happen when you dam up a stream. You obviously lose your uh, stream habitat, you convert it into a lake, you retain the water, usually that water is being used by humans for some purpose, whether it be for recreation, for power generation, or whatever it might be. And as to whether that's good or bad, you certainly lose the ecosystem services of the stream, but you gain the ecosystem services by the lake. The lake uh, can accumulate organic matter, and if there's no oxygen down there, you can produce methane, which can create uh, an issue, but it depends really on the lake and the hydrology of the system. It's a very, very complex question, but uh, certainly by damming uh, rivers and streams, you are creating uh, a new kind of habitat and changing the uh, nature of the ecosystem services being provided. Any other questions? That appears to be it for the moment. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending again. I really appreciate your taking the time and interest in helping to manage the, the lakes in the Poconos. And I encourage you, if you are interested in lake management kinds of questions, to start by gathering information on your lakes. Pleon is one mechanism to do that. Uh, independent consultants do it as well. Uh, Pleon doesn't give management advice per se, but will give you the basic data on your lake so you can understand it better and know whether it needs management solutions. And I encourage you to learn more about your lakes uh, through more Pleon workshops and other activities. So thanks again and time to go out and enjoy your lakes. <laughs>